All right, so we're going to move on to the final two speakers for today. Uh, next, we're going to have Paul Martin. Um, Paul's from the University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China. And he's going to be giving us a defense of academic game interpretations. Paul? OK, hello. Uh, I know it's been a long day, so thanks for coming back and hanging in there. Um, so the title of this presentation is The Defense of Academic Game Interpretations. Um, well, some game scholars, for example, uh, Marco Escalinen and Andrew Darley, have questioned the role of interpretations in the academic study of games. The practice of, and Graham Kirkpatrick yesterday also kind of questions the centrality of interpretations in uh, game scholarship. The practice of doing game interpretations in academia is not under sustained attack, so why bother with a defense? Perhaps defense is not the most appropriate term here. Perhaps a better way of describing this presentation would be as one philosophical explanation for the value or the potential value and role of interpretations in game scholarship. The philosophical position that the paper is based on is a combination of uh, Gadamer's philosophical hermeneutics and James L. Macker's account of the manner in which interpretive conventions change over time. That is, how particular ways of interpreting texts that are dominant in a particular school at one time fall out of fashion and are replaced with different ways of interpreting texts. The explanation based on this position is as follows. Game interpretations serve an important function in putting models of meaning construction in games into play and therefore risking these models. So for example, procedural rhetorics or the idea that a ga game is fiction and rules. So these models of how games create meaning are risked in game interpretations. I argue that interpretations are not derived from these models in any rigorous way, or at least not usually. Therefore, interpretations, singly or collectively, cannot prove or disprove the truth of particular models of meaning in the way that empirical experiments try to help to establish the truth of a scientific theory. Models of meaning can provide a framework for interpretation, but they're not universal. Rather, models synthesize what has been found to have been possible in game interpretations bringing into being new frameworks of interpretation, which are in turn challenged by new interpretations. If game interpretation is in no pressing need of a defense, it is, I think, in need of an explanation. Doing interpretations is, for many people, enjoyable. Uh, it's often done without any real explanation of why it might be worthwhile. Jonathan Culler, writing in 1976 in uh, English literature theory, is somewhat baffled by the resilience of new criticism, uh, a particular school of English studies in which interpretations figure large. Despite years of sustained, cogent, and largely accepted critiques of the, the school, he explains this resilience by the fact that the new criticism makes for good interpretations, which gives teachers something to teach students that students enjoy learning. David Bordwell makes a similar point in relation to film, Essentially, interpretations give film scholars something academic to be getting on with. Um, interpretations are enjoyable to do, and if you're of a certain mind, they're enjoyable to read. But both Culler and Bordwell and other critics of doing interpretations argue that there are more important things to be done and to be read. For Culler, the most important thing that English scholars should be doing is developing theory about how English literature actually works, its role in society, its institutional histories, the mechanisms of literary effects. He claims that interpretations are anathema to theory because they are essentially atomistic. Uh, interpretations pile up pell-mell, uh, individually interesting, but collectively furthering knowledge of the subject in no way. In the remainder of this presentation, I'll focus on the question of the relationship between models of meaning uh, and interpretations to explain why I think interpretations do further knowledge of games and how they do so. It should be noted that there are a number of other ways in which academic game interpretations uh, could be defended or explained that I'm not mentioning here. 
Um, philosophical hermeneutics. Uh, so this is Gadamer. Those of you who were here yesterday, apologies. I'm going to be repeating myself a little bit. Um, philosophical hermeneutic, as outlined by Gadamer in Truth and Method, takes understanding to be fundamental to our being in the world. We are finite situated beings, yet we can understand others who are situated differently. This understanding of others makes self-understanding possible, and it's our ability to seek self-understanding that characterizes our mode of being. As we heard in the keynote yesterday, Gadamer argues that understanding happens through a process of play, a back and forth movement that mediates between interlocutors. Play is the process of mediation through which the gap between people can be bridged without the collapsing of difference. As situated beings, there are limits or horizons, as Gadamer puts it, to our understanding. But because we exist in a common tradition, it is possible for those horizons to shift as we relate to other people who have different horizons of understanding. When we are really committed to understanding another but fail to do so, uh, we are thrown back on ourselves. We question what it is about our existing beliefs that prevented us from understanding the other's position and we reposition ourselves. We come back and try again, perhaps we understand a little better but still not fully and back and forth and so on until some understanding has been achieved. This sort of back and forth play is seen, for example, in conversation where interlocutors can question each other, ask for clarifications and try different ways of explaining. Gadamer points out that in conversations, neither of the interlocutors is fully in control of the conversation or where it leads. The conversation happens to each of its members as much as it is something that each of them does. Such is the nature of all play, and so Gadamer asserts of all understanding, or at least that's his position. Understanding is therefore a back and forth event rather than the end product of that event. This process, however, can produce something. This is what Gadamer calls transformation into structure. When the process of play becomes a spectacle for some audience, that in turn attempts to understand this process as, as spectacle. Uh, so in the keynote yesterday, Monica Wilhauer was uh, talking about this in relation to drama. But you could say just as a soccer match is a process for its participating players, but is also a process as spectacle for the crowd watching it so too can the process of understanding a text be shown to some audience. So I claim that when people write down and publish an interpretation, this is effectively what they are doing, transforming the event of understanding into a structure that is available to other people who in turn engage in another play of understanding with this interpretation. In encountering and attempting to understand a text, for example, a computer game, um, we begin with a set of beliefs and attitudes about what a computer game is and how to engage with it. These may be derived from game scholarship we've read, communication uh, models we hold dear, or more widespread conventions of what games mean and what they can mean. We have a first sense of what the game is about, perhaps from its title or our familiarity with the studio that developed it, and what our attitudes are to this theme or subject matter. These are what Gadamer calls prejudices. While prejudices are often understood in solely negative terms, uh, Gadamer claims that prejudices, far from being obstacles to understanding, are necessary to it. They are conditions of understanding. So prejudice isn't a negative thing, necessarily. Models of meaning in games uh, contain prejudices in this sense. Uh, that they, they enable understanding, their conditions of understanding. This is because the encounter between text and reader is a new thing in the world. And while an interpretation may in the end conform closely to what some model predicts, it may also present new possibilities of meaning and interpretation to which the model is not adequate. To say that a particular model is inadequate is not to say that the model is untrue or incorrect, but that it is not up to the task. The task being to produce an interpretation that is valid and valuable in a particular context. When we genuinely, genuinely try to understand a text, there will be moments when our prejudices lead us to an interpretation that the text resists. This resistance is based on what is, for Gadamer, the fundamental goal of textual interpretation, 
a harmony of the textual whole. Um, a text will resist bad interpretations because such interpretations will lead to an incoherent whole in a given interpretive situation. An interpreter who is committed to the play of understanding, aiming toward a coherent interpretation or some more or less well-defined goal of interpretation, will not stick doggedly to these prejudices in the face of resistance. Refusing to risk, one, risk one's prejudices is possible, but to do so one must remain closed to the, te to the text and to the ways in which it is meeting one's interpretive moves with responses that thwart one's interpretive aims. Um, so looking at specific interpretations in academic fields, we can see this happening uh, in relation to uh, models of meaning. Uh, Boardwell uh, in film, in cinema, has argued convincingly that when film scholars uh, use theory, uh, so I'm talking about models of meaning specifically, but he's talking about theory more generally, when they use theory to do interpretations, they do not apply these in any rigorous way, nor does the correctness of the theory seem to matter much to them. Rather, interpreters have a general sense of the purpose of doing an interpretation, which for Bordwell in the uh, interpretive community of film studies, the purpose of doing an interpretation is to produce novel and plausible interpretations. This is why film scholars do interpretations. And they make use of theories as, in his words, heuristic devices that yield institutionally approved results. Bordwell goes on to suggest that interpretations, therefore, bear no important relationship to theory. However, this is to ignore what happens to theory or in what I'm talking about, models of meaning, uh, when it becomes involved in the play of interpretation. Um, Gadamer's prejudices bear a close relationship to the concepts from other areas of interpretive theory of reading formations from Bennett, and interpretive communities from uh, Stanley Fish. Both of these uh, terms indicate sets of beliefs, attitudes, and strategies that guide interpretation, establishing the value of interpretations for a particular group, procedures for doing interpretations, and methods for, for distinguishing good from bad interpretations. When we interpret, we do so in a way that reflects the beliefs, attitudes, and strategies of the reading formation that we are making use of, or the interpretive community we're at that moment aligning ourselves with. To put this in Gadamer's terms, reading formations are composed of the prejudices that we bring to the text, and as such are indispensable to the task of interpretation. We cannot interpret from nowhere. While we can draw on different reading formations and combine strategies, beliefs, and attitudes derived from different reading formations, we can never interpret without one. So what are we interpreting when we interpret? If understanding is our way of being in the world, then there can be no question of a pre-interpretive state. As James Risser puts it, discussing Gadamer's hermeneutics, there is no zero point from which meaning is first encountered. Understanding is our means of gaining access to our world. In everyday language, uh, we speak of interpreting a book or interpreting a game as though the book or the game is a pre-existing object awaiting interpretation. But the book or the game is as much a product of interpretive effort as it is an object of interpretation. For Gadamer, the work of art, talking about art, uh, he says the work of art is not an object that awaits interpretation by an audience, but the encounter with the work of art, he says, is an encounter with an unfinished event and is itself part of that event. That is, interpretation does not entail a subject-object relationship between interpreter and text, but is rather an event that is shaped by, among other things, the situation of the interpreter. If texts come into being through interpretation, then what are we interpreting when we say we are interpreting a text? Approaching the question from a different perspective and not drawing on Gadamer, uh, Macker argues, when a novel, poem, newspaper, article, or any text as graphic or oral sign enters the field, it becomes part of the site for interpretation. But what gets interpreted is not the text, 
but the portion of the reading formation, the interpretive field, in operation during the particular sense-making act. When we try to understand a text, a reading formation becomes part of the event of understanding just as much as the interpreter does. This is because what an interpretation asks is not what does this text mean, but what kinds of meaning can be generated through an encounter between this text and the reading formation of which the interpreter is part. This is a version of Gadamer's insight that all understanding is self-understanding, but pitched not at the level of the individual, but at the level of the reading formation that the, that the individual draws on, or the interpretive community of which the individual is a part. Uh, when the play of understanding happens, reading formations shift as their conventions are risked. This is what Macro means when he says the reading formation gets interpreted. Uh, strategies that worked before do not work now. New strategies are attempted, worked on, attempted again, played with. The play of understanding where prejudices are risked can also be understood as an event in which the reading formation is risked. Macker argues that it is through individual interpretations that are accepted, rejected, or amended by others who share in a particular reading formation that this reading formation changes. Such changes can occur because reading formations are not discrete clubs where membership of one discounts one from membership of another or where the characteristics associated with one are found nowhere else. Indeed, it is precisely because interpreters tend to be theoretically promiscuous in their pursuit of good interpretations, whatever good means in a particular interpretive context, that reading formations change as specific interpretations point to new ways in which the goals of interpretation can be achieved. Uh, models of meaning in games are derived from game scholars' understanding of games, an understanding that happens through the play of understanding that is the encounter between players as scholars and games. As previously mentioned, doing interpretations writing down and publishing the process of understanding at play in one's encounter with a computer game can be understood as a transformation into structure. It is only when we do interpretations that transformation into structure of this play of understanding takes place. And it is when this transformation into structure takes place that the conventions and prejudices through which this understanding is possible are brought forth, exposed, risked, and interpreted. Without interpretations, these remain in the dark. So rather than being irrelevant to models of meaning, as Culler and Bordwell might say, or a means uh, by which models of meaning in games can be demonstrated or even proven, specific interpretations of games are interwoven in abstract model building. Uh, the process of understanding games precedes this, and it is only when this process is brought forth, brought forth and transformed into structure that the conventions and assumptions upon which the model is based are made clear. This is not to say that we do not need conceptual frameworks or models of meaning, uh, but that it is not these, but these models don't necessarily come first. On one side, models do help to generate interpretations. Indeed, interpretations cannot happen without them. On the other side, interpretations test what models can do, refining and changing them. But this does not lead to some universal model of meaning making in games. These models will necessarily be provisional because how understanding works is not ahistorical, but is located in particular contexts, that is, reading formations or interpretive communities. What we can understand are the conventions that operate in particular contexts of understanding. Uh, interpretations are important in understanding these, not because they get at what a game really means, but because they get at and bring forth the possibilities of meaning in games in particular contexts. Uh, it's perhaps remiss of me that in a paper arguing for the importance of doing game interpretations, I haven't engaged in the interpretation of any games. Uh, the full paper does offer an interpretation of the game Prison Architect, which was mentioned in the uh, keynote this morning. And in the paper, um, Paolo Pedicini wrote a really great review of Prison Architect a couple of years ago when it was still in beta. And I, in the paper, I take that review and think about how you could think differently about Prison Architect um, and how that might change how we 
model meaning or how we think about meaning in games. Um, so so that, that is in the paper if you're interested in reading it. However, this interpretation, as all inter interpretations are, is not just an example of what I'm proposing. If I'm right in what I'm saying here, then this interpretation of prison architect not only makes use of the propositions and conventions here dis discussed, but also puts them into play. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Any questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. I really think this theme of interpretation is just as important as the theme of meaning. Uh, and let me ask sort of a broad question based on that. Um, there are two interpretive positions, I think, uh, or at least maybe this is in popular culture and academic culture, but one is that all interpretations are equal, or that the diversity of t interpretations is important, and the more diverse, uh, the better. And the other sort of meta position is that some interpretations are wrong, or, and other interpretations are more proper, or more correct, or more accurate. Um, could you just comment on that, maybe, uh, as to what your position is and how your talk sort of would answer or, or position yourself uh, between those two perspectives? Yeah. Um, so my position on that is that uh, some interpretations are wrong in a particular context. So, this, so my position is pretty much Stanley Fish's position in is there a text in this class? So he says that um, uh, any interpretation that you can think of could be valid if you also think of an interpretive community that would validate it. That interpretive community may not exist in the world, but it could come into existence theoretically. So in any reading, for, uh, it, let's say, interpretive community that has particular strategies of how to transform a text into meaning, there are a limited, but probably in most interpretive communities, more than one interpretations that can be validated of any kind of complex text, um, and some that will not be validated within that community. But how do we recognize those? Which is which? How do we validate the ones? They're, they're validated based on uh, a consensus within that community that certain uh, members of the community have certain authority. Um, there are uh, tropes or figures that are accepted as being centrally important in how you read a poem or uh, interpret a game that, if used correctly, lead to valid interpretations. So um, the example, for example, uh, the, the Pac-Man enemy example, uh, that can we think of the Pac-Man enemy as a lover rather than an enemy? So I could offer an interpretation of that and say, Pac-Man's enemy is his lover. In fact, uh, yes, it leads to game over if I try to consummate that relationship, but that means something about sexual relationships that the, when it's consummated, the individual is destroyed or something like that. Now, I can offer that to you, and you can all say that's a load of rubbish, um, but I can imagine an inter interpretive community for whom that would not be a load of rubbish. Uh, but it depends on how you, how you come back as a, as a community. Uh, so, Paul, uh, it's time to be a little bit uh, nasty, right? Uh, you're asking for it. Uh, I'm, I'm curious <laughs> about this, um, uh, about um, uh, where, do you, where do you see this in terms of the old uh, distinction between theory and criticism. Is it, is it criticism you're talking about here, basically, game criticism? Uh, and if so, uh, do we have any good, I mean, there are, there are obviously good examples of game criticism, uh, but are there any good examples of academic uh, game criticism that is actually, you know, important, successful, what have you? I mean, only one, I, I only need one example. 
I don't really need it either, but I'd like to hear one. I don't know if I do have one off the top of my head. Thank you. Uh, I'll <laughs> uh, let me think about that. Then. All right. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, oh, well, I, uh, uh, this afternoon I really thought um, Feng Ju's interpretation of oblivion was great. Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, you're asking in an academic context. In the paper I talk about Paolo Predicini's interpretation of prison architect, that was published in uh, uh, Kotaku, so it's not an academic space, though it is an academic writing. Um, but no, let me think on. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's a well-played journal, um, Hungry Melon, that is, that is pretty much all of the journals that are in this kind of interpretive themes. Well, what about Ian Bogos talking about, um, what game is it now? The Sims Hot Date in his book. Uh, I think it's in Unit Operations. That's good, I think. Yeah, thanks for your talk. It's inter many interesting points, but I had the same concern as uh, Professor Myers in the, when it comes to the validating uh, criteria and the way you answered started to answer his question, reminded me immediately about the Kuhnian paradigm, because you have, you have this context where you have this procedure of interpretation, but simultaneously, as you say, you have to imagine, uh, first of all, there is, uh, is a real community of interpreters, but secondly, they also appeal to the same means for interpretation, and you can tick off a lot of factors that coincide with the factors that Kuhn Thomas Kuhn lists when it comes to his conception of paradigm. Of course, he has different uh, definitions of paradigm, but still he gives this very precise um, uh, definition of factors that um, are kind of embedded in the conception of a, of a paradigm. So it's, it's, to me, in your answer, it seemed as if you built up towards a kind of a paradigm uh, understanding of what should be eventually normatively too, and the, the right or the, the the justifiable interpretation, the viable interpretation eventually. I, I don't know if you have any comment on that because, th at least in theory of science, I mean, if this if this interpretation procedure sh should be counted as science too, we could think that okay, we could apply the um, Kuhnian paradigm thinking about that as a, as, a kind, as a specific kind of science and hence you have a kind of validation because that's part of theory of science so you know how to how to pursue these, uh, these justif justification procedures. I don't know if you understand are that. You, are you talking about the way in which uh, reading formation would come into being? As More the validating, validating criteria. The, uh, you were talking about, okay, the shared uh, common set of concepts, the shared common set of val values, mm -hmm. the shared common set of models, the shared, com you know, they, 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 you know, and you have a, a del delimited community of interpreters. A lot of these factors are tick-offs for the Kuhnian paradigm. Uh, so the, the only reason why I draw, <laughs> take that in, or suggest that here is not just to suggest something else. It's, it, it has to do with how to place this kind of pr procedure and process within the, in the context of theory of science. Okay. And, yeah. yeah, I don't know enough about uh, Kuhnian paradigm to make that connection. But are you suggesting that uh, it would be, it is something that could inform what I'm saying or that yeah, because you seem to be, at least in your reply uh, to Myers, you seem to um, 
you seem to list some factors that to a certain extent coincides with the Kuhnian paradigm and okay. you said but well I'm not quite sure you know you you kind of stopped at a certain point and it was a bit unclear where how you delimited that procedure so I was thinking that maybe the Kuhnian paradigm could be of help also in, in order to just um, to, um, to justify um, mm. this kind of interpretational um, procedure as, as scientific in some sense or another. Is, is this enterprise scientific or is it, or is it just another uh, enterprise of interpretation which whoever can do? And it might have important implication for the game theories generally. Right, right. Uh, I don't think it is, a sci it is scientific in that sense. Um, you, I think when people talk about reading formations or interpretive communities, they, they are kind of very vaguely defined and, and shift very easily between uh, things that are uh, interpretive strategies that are in favor or not in favor. Um, so, like, for example, Bordwell says with films, and he's criticizing 1980s film scholarship being too much about interpretation. And he says, really, the, the, all of the strategies for interpretation of films at that time is based on really just the value of producing novel and plausible interpretations. And beyond that, sort of anything goes, as long as you get to a novel and plausible inter Now, what is plausible is determined to an extent uh, by what strategies you have used to, to reach that interpretation. Um, but I, I, I don't know how to more precisely define that. Thank you. Just to tie that together with what Professor Orsett was talking about. Uh, it seems to me like maybe the reason why we can't sort of offhand think of very good examples of interpretations is because it's all puzzle solving within the paradigm. Um, so it's sort of tiny contributions that furthers the paradigm. Um, so the kind of really good examples that we might want to look for are the sort of revolutionary science or the equivalence of that, the kind of stuff that makes us completely rethink what games are. Um, so those are perhaps the kinds of examples to look for. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was also interested in that question of what, what makes an interpretation valid. And if I heard you correctly, you had a sort of view in which uh, um, the validness is relational, so to speak, to a group of people. So uh, if I understand you correctly, it would be a theory of validity, which would say that a certain interpretation is valid for a group A. Uh, let's say if and only if uh, group A agrees that uh, the interpretation is valid. Would that, would that be a short? Uh, I think so, yeah. yeah. Right, I mean, the, the kind of caricature of that is usually Marxists and right. Freudians, right. that these are the kind of stereotype interpretive communities of the right. 20th century, that uh, you can do a Freudian interpretation of Hamlet and go to a psychoanalytic conference, and it's fine. Right. I, I think but not in a Marxist. Right. I think that you, you could probably find uh, sort, sort of um, unpleasant examples uh, in which you would have interpretations that would be made valid by that criterion, which we wouldn't want to be and want to have. But more abstractly, it seems to me that there would be two problems with a criterion like that. Uh, first, it, in, in, it implies that group A is infallible, which is uh, uh, about their interpretation. All they need is to agree about it, which is the extremely uh, bad epistemology. There's no reason to think that they should be. And another problem is that uh, it would make uh, discussion, reasoning about the correct interpretation with that group, pointless. Um, well, reading formations and interpretive communities do overlap. So that's the way, it, when James Macker is talking about how these evolve, because they overlap, you can have someone who is both a Marxist and a Freudian, for example. Um, so, uh, d so discussion can happen in that way. But uh, there's, n there's no trump card. Um, it is a, a debate that happens, and there is a, a politics within these interpretive communities that gives voice to certain positions more than others. Um, 
so, so debate does, discussion does happen over what this Freudian interpretation is better than that Freudian interpretation. Um, for that reason, that there's no written rules. It's not just following an algorithm of this is how you interpret a text. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. That was really interesting.